We want to remind everyone we have social media exclusive content like our two minute drill as well as other video content. To find that, please make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok for more. We are kicking off episode number 10 on the Let's Be Frank video podcast. I am Jason Newey. Of course, I'll be joined by Hall of Fame head coach Frank Monica. Have a great show for you tonight. We have week nine recaps of LSU football, week 10 previews, LSU Tulane, Saints football talk. We're also going to have on special guest Eric Held of the LHSAA. And Coach is going to talk about cutting in high school sports. But before we get to Coach, we want to go ahead and thank our title sponsor for being the sponsor of the Let's Be Frank Video Podcast, Accardo and Dufresne Law Firms, your go-to River Parish lawyers. So, Coach, we're about to get things off with the playoffs, just uh, skipping a jump away. Week 10 games. How difficult is it to keep your team focused with the playoffs looming right around the corner and a lot of rematch potentially happening? Well, the one thing that if if you if you're if you're fighting for a position, and uh, the coaches know their bracket, they know their bracket. They're ready. They're ready. Research this. They figured it out, and they t- they can tell you exactly what a win will do for them and who they play. Uh, you know, the the twenty eight teams and twenty four teams. It's it's pretty easy to figure that out. Uh, even though it's a game away because a lot of them are in district play, they won't move too far, uh, but a, a loss could bump a, a team down, and that matters a lot. One spot can matter a lot about who you play and who you beat in the first round, second round, because there is a big difference in the brackets. Uh, you know, sometimes you don't want to face a certain team that's uh, too early in the bracket. Uh, maybe you don't mind. You know you have to face them if you want to win the whole thing, but you don't want to see that to happen the second week of the season or maybe the first week of the season. So believe me, they know there's something out there still to play for. Thanks, Coach. And we're going to take a look at our recaps first in our first segment of prep talk. Coach, in our first game, we had Southern Lab taking on Kentwood, and we know what a tightly contested game that is. Southern Lab went into the fourth quarter down 31-19, to came back, scored a touchdown, made the two-point conversion to go up 33-31 to to cap that game off. That's a big win for them. Well, we, we, we predicted that last week on, on the show because, you know, Kentwood is a different football team when you take them away from the, underneath that tower. And uh, they had to go to Southern Lab, and Southern Lab is a talented football team. So this was no, there was no surprise. In fact, we knew there was going to be an excellent ball game, as you can tell by the score. Absolutely two really good lower-class ball clubs. In our next game, we had St. Charles defeating Country Day 49-7. to No shock there. We know Country Day is really – a thin ball club. They don't have a ton of numbers. And St. Charles just seems like just continues steamrolling through their schedule and playing at a very high level. You know, the, the, the game unfolded exactly like you wanted to. Uh, they get a, a kickoff, di- knocked them down, knocked Country Day down deep in their territory. They ended up punting the ball in a very short punt. Uh, St. Charles had good field position most of the night. Uh, Brady St. Pierre was really through, through the ball extremely well. And then they got two running backs there, Willis and and the Scully Edwards are really having phenomenal seasons there. So their offense is really clicking. And then, the, uh, you know, their defense has played well all year long. And, and so they're a complete team. They, they, they complement one another uh, in, in terms of that. Kyle Cannon had another pick six. And then he's, you know, he's, he's had a phenomenal year. And he's been recruited by a lot of people. And I think the, um, this, could be, this week is going to be a little bit different uh, as far as the, the competition. So we'll find out. And we'll talk about that game later, of course, as they're going to take on Newman. But uh, looking at our next recap, we had Catherine New Iberia defeating Lowerville 14 to nothing. Catherine New Iberia kind of not getting a ton of noise, but are right up top of their bracket right now. I think they're sitting around three. A big win for them. Coach Desimo has done a great job going over there. They were unknown at the beginning of the year. They got a couple of early losses, but now they're starting to move and improve. And it looks like he's got he's trying to change that culture a little bit to get it back because they used to be a real good football team. And they went to Lauraville to play at Lauraville, and that's not an easy place to play against a lot of speed. But I don't know if Lauraville played that best ball game, but give a lot of credit uh, to Catholic High. They're a team to be reckoned with. And because that's exactly what I talked about earlier. There's someone that you can face early in the playoffs that you don't want to, that you don't want to see. Definitely talking about teams you don't really want to face in the playoffs. In our next matchup, you had St. Thomas Moore defeating Westgate 31 to 21. St. Thomas Moore seems like they're the team to beat in that division two select side of the bracket. They are a phenomenal ball club, extremely well coached. And they always seem to put up big numbers offensively. And they have real, they have real good players. They're well coached, as you said, a lot of numbers. 
they're number one in power ranking. It, it's going to be hard to, to take them down because they can play defense, play off at the fast pace offense that they that they run there, and their special teams are always really good special, really. So uh, you, you can look for them to, you know, Coach Hightower's got them going again. It's you want to win his coaches in Louisiana. It's no surprise that they, they'll be the Superdome uh, when that time comes. I hate to be somebody's bulletin board material, but man, St. Thomas More versus Lafayette Christian sounds like a really, a really great way to cap off the season if we can get that game in the dome. In our next matchup, we had Santa Ma taking on Walker. Santa Ma had won 31 to 28. You mentioned Santa Ma hadn't had a ton of marquee games on their schedule. Walker, a really solid ball club and well coached as well, but uh, it was a Gators night. That's a huge, huge win for Santa Ma. Really helped their their power ranking, you know, and uh, they, they, they have a they have a real physical football team. Not a great speed, but a very physical football team. They're big up front. Walker, with you know, Coach Mahaffey's got him going over there. He's changed that culture within a couple of years here. Uh, but Coach Oliver, you can't be happier for a guy that that's really paid his dues there at Santa Monica over all the years and uh, that he's been there. So. Uh, tribute to them and you know we like to see both these teams advance and they're both pretty high in, in, in their power ranking right now so you, you can see them both get a, a first round bye in our next matchup we had holy cross defeating jesuit 30 to nothing which uh, score that jumps out a bit since this is the first shutout that's occurred since 1976 which is saying something of course the 104th meeting between these two ball clubs uh, a history rivalry that you've been a part of. What is it like to be a part of this rivalry? And it, is that score a bit shocking for you to see? It's not, it's not a shock. The Jesuits offense right there did not play well. Uh, they only had like 130 yards total offense on, on the night. They only had a couple first downs in, in the first half and Holy Cross methodically had, had some nice long drives kind of tell us led the way right there. Uh, this is the, 122nd meeting of these of these two schools, you know, and as we said before, they were original members of the LHSAA, and uh, you know that tradition goes way back. I remember when I was judging in high school. There's a picture in, in their hallway of a, a Jesuit, a Holy Cross game, and I forget the year. And it's at Tad Gorman Stadium, and the stadium was packed. In fact, everyone there was dressed up. All the men had had coats and ties on and a hat. It's a tremendous picture. Uh, but but that, that that just goes to show you the tradition there that goes on for years. And there's a lot of things and activities that take place with Hall of Fame guys being announced at halftime and stuff at this special meeting. So it's uh, great to see those things. And, you know, you know, tradi- there's always saying that tradition never graduates. And it's great to see that ha- still happen in high school sports. Thanks, Coach. In our next game, we had Destrahan defeating East St. John 23-13. to This was truly Destrahan's. First test in what feels like quite some time on their schedule. Destrahan ended up powering through in that ball game. East St. John has a very talented offense, a very talented ball club. But Destrahan's defense is smoldering opponents. This is the most points they've given up all year in one game. It's unbelievable. Yeah, 13. It, 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 you know, it, it really, East St. and Destrahan is a beneficiary of two turnovers. They created, I mean, you have to give them credit for creating the two turnovers, but it had been a different ball game. Plus, the Lee did not play in the ball game for Destrian. I don't know if that mattered an awful lot, uh, but the Destrian will, will be sound. They're going to be a sound football team. Uh, unfortunately, there's a couple of teams in that bracket that, are, that that they have to contend with, and we'll talk about that later. But, uh, you know, right now, they, you know, they're on the win streak, one of the longest win streaks in River Parish in, in the state. Destrian is holding on to right now. So their team destined to go a little further. It surprised a little bit. Their power ranking is not as high as you would think uh, because they're for, for a 9 0 team. I think they're I think they're up to 25. It's it's up there. I'm not I'm not sure the exact number, but it's uh, Destrian's win streak has been quite impressive, no doubt. In our next game, we had John Curtis defeating Brother Martin 26 to 7. It seems like Curtis just has Brother Martin's number. They kind of pulled away at the end of the state title game. I think part of it is Curtis has that ability to ground out the football game, which is exactly what Brother Martin wants to do. And when you would try to run the football directly at John Curtis, they have a massive defensive line in front, and their linebackers play the ball very well. They're a tough team to beat if you're going to try to run the ball at them. Yeah, I think you know, when, you're, when your offense does match up to their defense, that doesn't bode well. So you have to do something differently. And, uh, and Brother Martin, I didn't see that particular ball game. But you knew Curtis was also motivated by the fact that they wanted to get the, the, the tie this record for Coach Curtis. And you know they were motivated by that. Uh, that had a lot to do with it. And as you said, Brother Martin's not explosive. They're more of a, a, a ground attack, well-balanced attack. 
but they're not as explosive as, 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 as a lot of teams that, would, that you need to have to be the Curtis team. But Curtis is methodical themselves. So they were two teams that are very, very similar in, in their pattern and how they, they complement one another. So, but, uh, but Curtis is starting to get their stride after those two losses. And uh, the thing about them, uh, someone is going to probably draw them early in the rounds, and that's not what you want to do. You don't want to draw Curtis early in the playoffs. And that's kind of what caused chaos last year when you had these teams in the, the Division One select side of the bracket. Coach is going to be ridiculous. And it, it seemed like last year there was one side that was much more heavy top to bottom than the other, and it's going to be – a lot of luck of the draw when it comes out in that bracket. We're going to get into that a lot more next week, but that's going to be a fascinating bracket to watch. Mm-hmm. In, our, in our next game, we have Carr, who took on Rommel. Coach, you got to some insight on that game. 39-31 to 31 victory in favor of Carr, but Rommel right there in the thick of it. Pushed them to the limit. Maybe a surprise to some people, but with all the injuries that Rommel has had, that's a, a fantastic job that they did coming out and playing them so tight in that game. I don't know if Carr was looking forward to playing John Curtis or what the deal was. But, uh, you know, we really fought with a young football team. Uh, they threw two interceptions. That really hurt them. They had the ball with five minutes to go, and they were on, on down by two. They actually had held the lead prior to that before a punt return and kickoff return was their demise. And those so special teams came back to haunt them a, l- a little bit. Uh, and you have to be very, very sound. Of course, they got a special team touchdown of their own on the kickoff return. So Rumble's got a couple of playmakers, but – but Carr's got four guys in the secondary and three of the four already SEC commits. So just go to show you the type of talent that they have. But one thing, it, it should show Rumble that maybe uh, with, with a little luck here that they can play with, with, with most people in the state. We're done with our recaps. We're going to look at some of our previews. Coach, in our first game, we have Parkview Baptist taking on University Lab. This is basically for these – not basically. This is for the 6-3A uh, district title. Both teams average 43 and 44 points a game. They give up 13 and 12 points a game. They're pretty much mirror images of one another. Uh, big big out-of-conference schedules. Uh, but really, when you look at U-High, their offense is led by Emil Piccarella, four-star quarterback who transferred him from Mississippi. He's been phenomenal all season long. And their linebackers for U-High are just are incredible. They have a ton of talent. Parkview is going to have to find a way to – move the football against that defense. I think that's really going to be the matchup to watch is this offensive part view versus the physicality and the linebackers that are on the field for you high. For years, the tradition has been to play this game on a Thursday. And I think the reason is I think that they like to have that extra day, maybe to look at the playoff scenario and things of that nature. And, and, uh, but of course they're both, they're both in position, maybe to draw by for that first, but you're right. The quarterback was not there earlier since he's got cleared to play. Uh, he's made the difference in U High. The only loss was against Rumble earlier in the year when Rumble was a healthier football team than they are now. But it's a team that you don't want to play. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they, right now, they're locked in the four spot, and I, that's not going to move for them, win or lose in, in this particular ball game. Uh, I don't see I don't see Parkview winning this football game, but um, but who knows? You know, that's a big robbery. They're right across town from one another. Uh, similar school, similar kids. They know one another, so and they're both well coached. So this could be a real real battle on Thursday. Should be a fascinating matchup. And our next matchup, we have East St. John, who's going to take on Holy Cross. Both teams come in 7-2. and two. East St. John's 13 in the non-select Division I bracket. Holy Cross at 3. Uh, with that win last week, they cement themselves as one of the top seeds in that part of the bracket, which, as we know, is huge. East St. John has a ton of playmakers on the perimeter offensively. Dakai Joseph, Coral Gray, Kendall Walker, Jermaine Mangle. And I think that's going to be the big matchup. We know what Holy Cross can do offensively with the amount of weapons they have on the perimeter. Um, but I'm really interested to see uh, Matthew Casimo, Reese Gordon, Tommy Ashby in that secondary of Holy Cross taking on these wide receivers of East St. John. Well, I, I think East St. John's got speed. They, they, they have a, I saw them in the summer in 7-on-7, seven seven, and they got some speed at the wide out position. Their speed can actually negate those cornerbacks that Holy Cross has. But I think the bottom line is going to be – can. Can they sustain a ground game? Uh, or is it, are they just going to throw it up? And and they have to, first of all, stop Holy Cross because Holy Cross will give them a mixture. They will give them a mixture. They're well-tested. They're battle-tested. East St. John has had maybe one or two decent, uh, I think, competitors on their whole schedule uh, where Holy Cross has been battle-tested. And the question is how much are they going to put into this ball game 
being that's your week 10, knowing that both of them have a higher power ranking, but they both can move, actually move up with that. So this could be a real, real uh, fun game to watch. Absolutely. In our next game, we have the big matchup, two battle the two undefeateds, Newman taking on St. Charles Catholic. Newman has done a phenomenal job all year. A lot of people have said, despite losing a lot of talent, maybe better than last year. A ton of talent, Division One level talent, really, up front for this offensive line. You have Brett Bordelon, who's already committed to play at LSU. You also have uh, Held Manning. I think that's going to be the biggest matchup of the game, Coach. We know what Eli Fien, a friend, can do at quarterback. St. Charles' offense has put up a lot of points, 37 points a game to be precise. But really, I'm interested to see what Kyle Cannon and his defense can do and what the big boys can do in uh, Jaden Bro and Matthew Loop. Can they contain this uh, offense of Newman? Well, I think that, you know, that both coaches, Coach Wayne Stein and, and Coach uh, Nelson Stewart, are both very close. They, they, they speak on a daily basis about one another, and, and they know they're on a collision course not only on Friday, maybe with the possibility if they, if they both could run through this bracket, maybe face it again in the playoffs. Uh, so, But the bottom line is that they both want to win this football game. The winner goes to number one, and that's how crucial it is uh, in terms of your, your placement. And number one, actually, <laughs> maybe not, that's not the best spot to be when you look at the rest of the bracket. But, uh, you know, uh, for St. Charles Catholic, you know they want to run the table. They have, to have a, a perfect season, 10-0. Uh, and, and Newman, Newman's sitting there too in the position. One thing that Newman has done, I must say this, they've improved their schedule because in past years they've always had some some teams on their schedule that weren't very very you know competitive. But they've improved it. They put some five A schools in there, like like Hornville. They put the Bell Chases in there. They put Dallas South, Manning. So they've been battle tested and all just to get themselves ready for the playoffs. Because in the past they they faced physical teams that gave them trouble. But now I think that I understand that their offensive line average is 300 pounds. So they, they have some people up front. The quarterback is is the real deal, and they can mix and match. But yet, you know, um, just think that the whole package that St. Charles brings too. And, uh, you know, biggest thing I look for in this ball game is the turnover ratio. Uh, the, the team that does not turn the ball over will win this football game. Also look at special teams. We know the comments are very good, and special teams have a, a ton of – a big plays, whether it's blocking or returning. I think special teams are going to be a key in that ball game when you look at that matchup. In our next game, we have another district title on the line, 8-3A in this case. Edie White taking on St. James. St. James has uh, only lost one ball game. Now it's the 5A East St. John, who we mentioned has a lot of athletes. Braden Williams is the quarterback at St. James. I've been watching him since he was a freshman, really. A, a very talented quarterback. He has some three-year starters on the perimeter and Kobe Brown and Rayshon Charles. And Edie White, again, has a, that option offense that they've really done a great job of. That's going to be a, a, a very fascinating contrast of style, the high-flying, high-powered offense of St. James versus the more steady system of Edie White. Well, I think the, the bottom line here, the more physical team normally wins, and, and, and that points towards Edie White. They're very physical, very big. Uh, they, they take care of the football on um, defense. They're very, very sound. And you know where they're going to line up. There's not a fancy defense, but you know exactly where they're going to be. The problem is you got to block them. And uh, so it, it, they can, they can, they can really make that quarterback scramble, make him move his feet for St. James and uh, St. James have to manufacture some, some explosive plays. Uh, it's going to be hard for them to maneuver the ball down a few 70 yards and drive the ball down a few. So they're going to need some explosive plays of 40, 50 yards or better to be in this ball game. Thanks, Coach. In our next matchup, we have John Curtis taking on Edna Carr, which you have number one in the power ratings versus number 10. But we know that when you look at that side of the bracket, you kind of got to toss power ratings out the window. Carr has an exceptional offense, has played phenomenal defense, has kind of gone under the radar a bit. I'm really fascinated to see this physical Carr defensive front take on the big boys of John Curtis. We talk a lot about offensive defensive line matchups. In this game, I think it's probably one of the best offensive defensive line matchups you're going to see maybe in the entire season. The biggest thing, we, we talked about special teams in this thing. Who do you kick it to? They got three, as I said earlier, they got three SEC guys back there on kickoff and punt return that they can that they can put there. And every one of them could go to the house. So uh, the big thing is, one, 
uh, don't punt the ball as best you possibly can. So I think Curtis will say, let's go forward and fourth down. Curtis got the motivation of breaking the national record in, uh, in, the, in the entire country. That's a huge, huge motivation for these kids And in terms of that. And I'm sure Coach Curtis is telling them, hey, let's not worry about that. That's extra pressure. This is a good football team we're playing. Let's worry about defeating Carr. But Carr, on the other hand, I think that last week they got a scare. I think that they would probably had a wake-up call there. And I think this could be a real, real good ball game to watch all the way to the end. And, uh, and like I said, I, I think Curtis is going to have to stop the explosive plays of Carr. If they can minimize that, they'll win the football game. If they can't, Carr can re- really put a lot of the points up quickly. Coach, you again, you were in the spotlight a ton during your time at St. Charles and everywhere that you've been. How difficult is it sometimes to get your players focused on the game? And when you do have some spotlight on you, whether it's, a big landmark victory coming up or anything along those lines. How do you get your players focused on themselves and the game at hand instead of worried about all the attention that's coming on it and maybe trying to play over their heels in an attempt to give you the glory that they feel like you deserve? You got to eliminate all the distractions. You got to change something and you got to make that focus that we call laser thinking. You need need to make that the most important thing of the week, not only just the game. You know, the intensity level, emotional level doesn't start on Friday night, 30 minutes before the ball game. That starts immediately after that last Friday night game. And that, that, that emotion, that drama starts to build up with preparation. And in your preparation, all your, your talks with your players and your coaching staff, you know, there's some words you don't use. There's some words you don't bring up. You don't want to hear that. And you with, with them. So this is this is a no-no. But these are the words you might want to the positive things as that you're focusing on on your film, your study, your technique, your fundamentals. Your fundamentals fundamentals never go away. And I think that's what coaches have to worry about. Worry about your blocking and your tackling, and the winning takes care of itself. Thanks, coach. In our next matchup, we have Karen Crow eight and one taking on Shaw, who comes in at seven and two. Shaw is at sixth in the division two select side. The bracket. Karen Crow is fourth. In Division One, non uh, is I'm sorry, Division One select side of the bracket. Really fascinating game. Karen Crow averages 48 points a game coming in. Really fascinating to see that matchup between Karen Crow's offense and Shaw's defense, led by Jaden Scott, that two lane commit. No, no question. Let's, Shaw's got a real good football team. Coach Tieran has done a real good job of molding that team, bringing in his culture there. Uh, but Karen Crow's a little different animal. They're 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 well coached. Uh, Coach Tony Corby will have them ready, prepared. They've they've always been really good in special teams. And look for he's got a lot of trick plays off the special team, and he really doesn't need that because he's got the people to go with it. So uh, this is going to be a real, real big test for Shaw. And really, they need it because if the last few ball games they hadn't been tested in terms of the competition level in, in their district. But so this is a real good ball game. But if people don't like to sometimes play that real tough game going into the playoffs. But I really think this helps you to keep the pressure on your players and it keeps them playing well, keeps them playing hard. And more importantly, it eliminates all distractions to keep them focused on the season. Thanks, Coach. In our next game, we have Rummel taking on Jesuit. We know how big of a rivalry this is. Both teams coming into this game, Rummel uh, trying to get some momentum going into the playoffs after taking that tough loss a week ago. Uh, how do they maintain focus here against Jesuit? Well, I think it's important for one. I think Rumble would like to finish the season at least five and five and go into the playoffs with a little swagger in mind. And on the flip side of this, has always been a close ball game. Jesuit, Jesuit finds ways to give Rumble, Rumble trouble every year. Uh, last year, that they, they, they had a, a running quarterback that was a little bit different. They have a big quarterback, uh, something like a six four, six five guy playing quarterback, and Coach Manali will have him ready to play. Uh, both teams are, are separated by one, 114, 115 in, in the, the power ranking. So uh, they, they're right there with it. And I think – so it, it all depends on who's looking forward or who wants to win this football game. If it's come down to that, uh, sometimes you, you get a team that looks like they both just play and they're not really – there's no team that you can say distinctively really want to win this football game. So who's the hungriest team right now and who's the team that wants to go in a row – and because, you you know, I always used to tell the team, you want to go into the playoffs with some momentum. You don't want to back into it. You want to go into some momentum. So this is one of those ball games that can prov- provide momentum for either team and maybe provide an upset down the road. In our next matchup, we have St. Aug taking on Brother Martin. Another contrast in style game. St. Aug likes to air it out. They can run the football, but uh, a very physical defensive front. We know Brother Martin likes to play smash mouth football, run the football with Jordan West in that ball club. And uh, it should be a, an interesting game 
because of the way that last week went for Brother Martin as well. And, you know, the, the St. Aug played two quarterbacks. The second quarterback came in the second half and looked like he spurred them a little bit and, and ignited that, that win for him. So it would be interesting to see how uh, who starts. Are they going to do a two-quarterback system? Uh, Brother Martins can run the football. So St. Aug can also can stop the run uh, because that defensive line, when they're ready to play, they're hard to stop. But this could be an interesting game again. What are those games where St. Aug got the speed and their explosive football team? They're going to need some explosive plays because Brother Martin will be sound. They will be because Bonis will have them have them sound on defense. They will be in position. Uh, but sometimes it's, you know it's, it's a good athlete can just outmaneuver an uh, average athlete. Uh, and Saint Aug certainly has the people that can do that. Uh, but I think St. Aug's trying to move up in their power ranking. So this game is a meaningful game for them. And, uh, and, and as you mentioned before, you know, Brother Morton has got a real uh, seed right now at five. I'm sure they would like to stay there. So this could be an interesting matchup. And our last and final preview, we have St. Helena taking on Pope John Paul, which is going to be for another district title. What do you see in this matchup? Coach, you know, Pope John Paul, credit to them. This is a this is the team that was in disarray just a couple of years ago. Uh, they, they weren't many one many one winning many games. Excuse me, they, and uh, they were struggling. That uh, one of the previous coaches that passed away, who was a good friend of mine, Coach Cryer, and, um, and but the, the team looks like it's kind of corrected itself, and it looks like they got some excitement at that school, and which you knew that they could they, they could always be a contender. And St. Helena will be speed against a, a methodical offense. So uh, this will be interesting. But but Pope John Paul has been very hot lately. So let's see how this thing works out. And that will do it for our high school segment as we go ahead and move on to our college football segment. Coach, in our first game, we had Tulane defeating Rice, holding on to winning that ball game. Uh, what did you see in that one? Well, Coach, uh, the, Tulane, there's a tale of two halves. They're really well, explosive in the first half. They didn't punt the ball at all in the first half. Uh, Michael Pratt was, was on target. Then all of a sudden in the second game, there was a pick six that Pratt threw, and I'm sure he'd love to have that play back. But, you know, Tulane made some, some gutsy plays at the end. They took the ball in the last drive when, when Rice was really making a run. Uh, Tulane's defense was giving up yardage. And, and uh, they, with a, same thing, same scenario as the week prior to that. Uh, when the offense had to, they made that final drive, knocking off eight minutes off the clock. And uh, and then when they did get the ball back, it was a funny thing. I don't know if you saw the end of the game, but the, the funny thing, the way that the clock management never did understand, uh, Tulane took two knees and it only knocked off three or four seconds off the clock. And there were slow knees. That's the difference between a slow knee and a, and a fast knee. There were slow knees, you know, and, uh, and, it, it, and it, they ended up giving the rights the ball back. Uh, where they could have kicked a field goal or tried to score, but they gave the ball back with four seconds left, which is good because that limits you to just one play deep in your territory. But all in all, Coach Fritz is really happy to get out there with a win. You go on the road, and not many times in the past have they beaten Rice. As I said last week, you know, in 1979, we were 9-2 and two at Tulane, and one of those losses was to a Rice team. And uh, Rice was a very good football team that year. So credit to them at Coach Fritz. They're 7-1, and one, no matter how you slice it. They're seven and one, and maybe that's kind of a wake-up call for your team to say, "Hey, let's play four quarters." Coach, what does kind of come into play now is when you look at these tight ball games that Tulane is playing, an issue that you never had to face in high school. Everybody gets a fair shake. Everybody has an equal opportunity to make it to a playoff or get an opportunity to play on the bigger stage. Right now, Tulane is not in the pole position in terms of the Group of Five team that would be playing in a major bowl. So how, how do you think that would change your – would that have an impact on you in high school, the way you coach, if you had to worry about these quote-unquote style points, which is something that as a college you have to worry about. In high school, that's not really an issue. It's about power points. It's about the product on the field. You know, you know the, the, the big thing here with, with Tulane's situation, in, in the big picture at the end, they're going to look at your record. They're not going to worry about how you won ball game. Remember, TCU played for the national championship last year. And they had four or five games that they won on their last possession. And they barely won. And, of course, they got blown away in the final ball game, which a lot of people anticipated. But at least they were there. And it, it, with, a, with a guardian record, no matter how it is, people, you know, and, and the post of the guys put you in these bowl games, they're looking at records because it's really, really sexy. Uh, you look sexier as a team when you have a, you know, you have a 10-win, 12-win season or something like that. So I think that's more important. And, you know, uh, even in high school, People look at your record, and they don't care about who you played. If you're ten and zero, they don't care about that. Man, you're ten and zero. 
rather than if your team had played a real, real tough schedule and it might have been six and four. But you, but you might have been a better football team. But, you know, a lot of people in the media especially gets caught up into the record and really realize that some of these teams, could, you know, are not very good. But all in all, I think you give them credit because, listen, those guys are scholarship players too. So, so give them credit for, for, the, for the Ws that they have. Next week they go on the road and take on East Carolina. Not an easy place to play by any means. Uh, but, again, Tulane should be favored in this ball game. I believe they're favored by double digits. They fear, they fear about 17. It's, it's kind of a scary game because, again, they're going on the road. But I think that – and East Carolina plays differently. I mean, they, 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 they'll be a different football team uh, at their place. But And they're hungry. You know, they don't they – don't, now, can they, can they get themselves bow eligible? Probably not. So what are they playing for right now? You know, that's, that's what you worry about. So it's a coach's nightmare right now to try to motivate your team. You're talking to your players – you know, we talked to a coach last week that was on our podcast. He talked. He spent the off season off. I'm sorry, their off week, their open week, on talking to guys about transfer portals, talking to guys about coming out early. So you have to you have to do some damage control during that off week. So I'm sure the East Carolina staff is doing a lot of damage control when you're one and seven. Thanks, coach. In our next game, we have LSU, who's going to take on Alabama after their bye week. Of course, that bye week. Probably came at the best time for LSU with this matchup coming up. I, LSU has a lot of injuries right now defensively. And as we know, their defense has been suspect at, at many times in the season. Their offense has played, has played spectacular football, but it's a Nick Saban coach team. And even though they might not have as elite of a defense as they're used to, Saban teams are very difficult to beat. LSU, it almost feels like they're going to have to win a track meet if they're going to win this game. You're going to have to score every possession or or close to it. And do they have the offense to do it? Possibly. Are the odds in their favor on the road? Not really likely. Well, the, the, the bottom line here, you know, you, it's an, you said it earlier. It's a Nick Saban coach team. And now this open week kind of serves for them as a real big adjustment team because, you know, they're young. Uh, they're, they're not really great on offense. They're not as explosive as they were. Their quarterback is about as accurate as they've had in the past, but they're still Alabama. The question is their defense. Now, can D- Jalen Daniels and, and the LSU offense uh, do the same thing they've been doing? I don't think so. So you're looking for maybe a lower scoring game as far as the offensive production of the LSU's uh, against Alabama. Plus, Alabama's going to shrink the game a little bit. Again, you can look for, the, for this game to go down to maybe be the low scoring game. I, if I would bet this game, I would definitely bet the under, even though that uh, LSU has been explosive on offense. But this is a different animal when you take it on Alabama. And they say they're going to play you differently. They'll be very, very physical. And if that quarterback for Alabama, if he, 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 can, he can throw the deep ball, He's not very accurate, but if he gets if he gets on target, he could give really LSU a lot of problems. So I look for this to be a real low scoring ball game. But if you said it earlier, Jason, this is not the Alabama of old. They, they've been sort of a, they bend a little bit on defense, uh, but they won't give you the big play, you know, time and time again like a lot of teams have done in the SEC for LSU. Coach, fill the blank for me. LSU wins this football game if if LSU wins the football game if I think they can get to thirty. If they can get the 30 points for their offense, either way, all the special teams, they, they get the 30. Now, because Alabama's going to score that secondary, LSU's defense has not been tested for a while. They got a lot of young guys back there. Remember how poor they've been at the beginning of the season. Uh, we don't know for sure if they fixed that. Yeah, I don't think they would fix it totally, but are they better at that? They made some, they tweaked the, some guys out of position. They got a linebacker back. I think they understand what they want to do with Perkins now in terms of that, but their corners now are retreads. They're guys that are not really corners. And so uh, I, I can see Alabama taking advantage of that. Thank you, Coach. And uh, in our next segment, we have Saints talk. And the Saints defeated the Colts this week. Uh, not a great Colts ball club up this far. And then you have a game against the Bears next week. What can they do after this win to gain some momentum and uh, go on? Uh, you have a, again, a, a Bears team that hasn't been very good maybe looking for one of those early picks next season. Uh, what do you expect the Saints to do moving forward? Let me go back with just a little bit. That, you know, a week ago, everybody was crying about the play calling and stuff like that. All of a sudden, those same plays worked Friday. I'm talking about Sunday, same plays. Uh, they threw vertical two, three times to Shahid. And, I mean, he makes a great plays. And one of them was a catch that he had, and they almost stole it from him. And uh, this is the same plays that they've been, they've been using. Carr had an excellent ball game because – 
uh, you know, you throw up some 50-50 balls, some, the ones that sometimes they don't come down with them. Well, in other games, when you lose, they don't come down with this particular game. They came down with the deep balls. And uh, also, they, they, they just mixed the game up. I mean, they still were in the inside zone. Camaro just split them in the inside zone. Then Williams comes in, who I really love because he, he goes forward. And, I mean, he's, this guy doesn't lose any yards. And he's a hard, hard, tough guy. He's hard. To, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's hard as a rock. He's tougher than $2 steak. But, um, but you know, give them credit. Coach Carmichael called a great game. That's the same type of game he's been calling. Uh, they just happened to hit some of these big balls, the big routes. They, they hit a, a, a skinny post. Well, they've always run skinny posts. They hit a vertical to sheet. They've always run that. Michael Thomas hit, had, a, had a back shoulder throw. They've always thrown those same, those same routes. But all of a sudden, now nobody's talking about the play calling this week. All that happened, the players went out and made plays. That's the difference. Carr throws a beautiful ball. And, uh, but as you said before, let's get into the Chicago game. Let's hope that they can bring some momentum into this ball game. And uh, one thing I did like to see them do, they threw the ball vertically more than they normally do. They had some, some deep throws, and you really need to back up those guys a little bit because they'll squat on you. Those corners will gamble and squat on you. you know? And uh, there was one ball, in fact, card through in the, in the previous game against the Colts. It hit Alavi in the helmet. Uh, I don't know if he's turned around or, or you see it, but it was a big play. Then the next play, he's wide open again and, and car overthrows him. But, uh, you know, this is the same. And, and, the, and the defense looks like they, they, they're playing well, as they always do. But, you know, in the NFL, as we said before, uh, any win you get in the NFL is huge. They, they're right at the top right now in the division. Uh, so let's hope that they can play with some motivation and maybe get on the roll, especially at home against Chicago. All right, Coach, that'll do it for our first segment. So we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we will have our special guest, Eric Held of the LHSAA joining us. But before we do that, we want to go ahead and thank our title sponsor, Accardo and Dufresne Law Firms, your go-to River Parish lawyers. Samuel Accardo Jr. and R.A.P. Dufresne, your go-to River Parish lawyers. Experience, tenacity, and results. Sammy Accardo and Ari Dufresne provide comprehensive legal services in personal injury, hurricane claims, business litigation, successions, and estate planning. Our trial experience, know-how, and commitment to protect and serve our clients is unparalleled. We provide complete real estate, title, and escrow services through our affiliate, State Title LLC. The River Parishes is our home, and serving our communities is our passion. Based out of Gramercy, Louisiana, LSR produces Southern Cane Pure Cane Sugar, which is only grown, refined, and packaged in Louisiana. LSR utilizes the latest innovations in technology, as well as ensuring the growth and stability of Louisiana sugarcane farmers by integrating more than 800 growers in the industry's economic structure. Southern Cane is available in your local associated grocers and Rouse's supermarkets. Since 1972, Riverlands Insurance Services has been dedicated to securing the best insurance products and services available to protect you, your family, your assets, and your business. Our goal has been to establish a strong relationship and partnership between you, the insurance company, and our agency, creating a circle of success that prepares for disasters before they actually happen. Welcome back to the Let's Be Frank video podcast. Our special guest tonight is a former high school head football coach and the current assistant director for the LHSAA. We want to welcome in our special guest, Eric Held. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you taking your time. And, you know, you as a former coach in the LHSAA, how has that translated to what you do now for the LHSAA in your job? Great question. So as you mentioned, I taught and coached for 25 years, um, football for all 25, a number of other sports as my second sport, so to speak. And um, this is my fifth year as director of the Coaches Association. It's been a very rewarding experience. Um, what has helped translate over and make the transition easy is 
are the relationships that that you have. Uh, the thing that's been most rewarding for me is meeting coaches in other sports that I didn't know. Um, volleyball coaches, softball coaches, basketball coaches, just because a lot of times in football and other sports, baseball, track, golf that I coached, I wasn't able to meet coaches in those sports. So it's all about relationships, as Coach Frank knows. And, um, heck, he's old enough to know um, me as a player when he coached against me when he was a head coach at Jesuit and then I was a player at Brother Martin and then we coached against each other and I got to watch all his teams in baseball and football. And uh, it's all about the relationships, uh, building them, maintaining them, and um, that's what this is all about. Coach, you know, a lot of people don't understand the difference when they look at Louisiana High School Athletic Association, but you're in charge of the Coaches Association. Many people think it's just football coaches, but the, as you just said, the Coach Association is encompasses all the sports, and you're in charge of all those. Would you explain that briefly? Sure. So as you mentioned, a lot of people – don't understand the difference because I'm at the LHSA, I'm in the building, we work hand in hand in so many things throughout the year and, and on a daily basis. And as director of the Coaches Association, I head up um, um, just the with the coaches, our, our all-star events, um, overseeing um, our Coaches Association membership, which all schools um pay for their coaches, their athletic directors, and their administrators to be a member of our association. So many benefits come with that. One of them, of course, is our summer clinic um, where we provide professional development and coaches in all the different sports come in and a, a great opportunity to network as well. And that last event before you get into the school year. Um, but also with that, just working with assistant directors. We have four great assistant directors in our building, along with Mr. Bonine, working with them and uh, also helping him with the sport of football. I oversee the sport of golf as well. But um, going back to, to the Coaches Association, our Coach of the Year awards in, in the different organizations nationally, NFHS, um, National High School Athletic Coaches Association. So there's so many things out there that we do, that we provide for coaches. And then, of course, doing social media and providing coaches with professional development opportunities and making them aware of how they can grow in the profession and, and help better themselves. Because as you know, um, you never stop learning, Coach. Uh, that's one thing you're able to do with this is still connect with those college and high school coaches that come on as guests and you just continue learning. Coach, you know, a lot of people don't understand, but how many total athletes are there approximately in Louisiana? And you're you're responsible for all those. And when you know, when one of them gets a headache, you have to take an aspirin because I, I know you get a lot of phone calls from a lot, a lot of people, media, and parents, and about various sports and stuff. But how many athletes are you basically responsible for? Well, just for me, with being with the coaches association, we have over ninety five hundred coaches, close to ten thousand now. Um, coaches register. Throughout the year, our, our schools are registering uh, coaches throughout the year in the different sports. So they may not start um, on a coaching roster, but they end up getting added. So um, just we, we, we talk to coaches, athletic directors, administrators every day. And um, when you get into your sports specific, you'll have some parent questions. And we usually direct them to their athletic directors or those head coaches back in their sport just so that they can – um, learn to communicate with them and and uh, build that line of communication with with their school and because they're with their son or daughter every day and right. uh, again that's what it's all about building those relationships coach high school football is very, very popular high school athletics is very popular athletics no matter what what the sport might be but what is the atmosphere out there in high school with numbers and what are some of the issues that you constantly dealing with in terms of not being specific, but what's some of the big issues now that high school athletes and, and fans should be aware of? Sure. I think probably the biggest one, as you know, is the select non-select split is, is a all the time thing. Um, we hear it all the time. Um, everyone has a way to improve things. As you know, back in 2013, we saw the split take place in the sport of football. And since then, it's come in in uh, boys and girls basketball 
and um, baseball and softball as well. There have been other attempts or conversation to split other sports. Thankfully, that has not happened. Understand being on the other side now because I was a coach for so long, I guess, in all select schools. But being in this position, you get to hear the concerns of those that are on the other side, so to speak, and you understand where they're coming from. I think last year what the executive committee did um, with um, the brackets in those Very sports positive. that are split, mm -hmm. I think uh, you see things where it's more equitable, more competitive. You don't see the blowouts. And one thing I've heard from a lot of coaches is that they really enjoyed that. They may not have liked the timing of it or maybe how it was done, but they admit that. And you have some staunch coaches out there that are pro split that said, hey, this is this was a positive and uh, we liked it moving forward. And I think you saw that with the recent vote a few weeks ago at the at the Baton Rouge Marriott, where it just solidified with 67 percent of the vote from membership schools that they like the current definition of what a select school is. So the playoff structure we saw last year is moving forward this year. And that's probably one of the main things we hear about um, from coaches and athletic directors, those questions about select, non-select in the different sports. And then of course, the definition of select. Yeah, I know the coach did listen from a standpoint of, you know, I've coached on both sides of it. And, but, you know, there's nothing like the 32 team bracket where, you know, you're going to guarantee you play 15 games and, and you get a chance to travel during the playoffs and yeah, that's kind of going away. But this is what, what you guys have done with it and tweaked it. It's really, really helped. I think the, the sport itself coach uh, a little bit about the, you know, Louisiana is really, really considered one of the, I think one of the foremost states in the entire United States about their, their athletic program. I get calls. I said calls. I've had guys that coach in other states, and they were really, really intrigued about our power ranking system and uh, and how we how we tweak that and how it works. And uh, because they think that you know you get rewarded for uh, playing a real, real good schedule. Some people don't like it, but I mean, if you don't like it, just just play a tougher team to increase your your power ranking. What's your take on that? Sure. Um, as you know, coach. Coach Swacker, I think at Santamont was the one, correct me if I'm wrong, Coach, that kind of introduced that current um, power rating system, if I'm if I'm not yes. mistaken. You're right. Mm -hmm. And before that, it was – I remember in 1983, I was a seventh grader and on my way to Brother Martin as an eighth grader the next year. And I used to watch – my dad took me to all the games and had such a great time going to high school football games – and I remember in 83, Brother Martin was 9-0 and and lost in Week 10. And because of the tiebreaker back then, and they had buys, was left out of the playoffs. And um, the next year, the wild card system came in because of that. So that was an addition. Well, there needed to be some tweaks, and Coach Swacker and other coaches got together and came up with a system on, on how to improve that. There's always ways you can – or always ideas out there that, that can be made to improve it. We always ask people to, if they have any suggestions, to uh, present a proposal for that. Um, but I think the power rating system does as good a job as any to reward those teams who, of course, win games, but then play a tough schedule where those wins from your opponent count into the formula. And, of course, you divide by the number of games you play. So, um if, if you play a tough schedule, you are rewarded in the end, especially if you win those. And, of course, you get two points for playing up by division, and that was changed by the executive committee going into this football season where a division, a team in the Division Four playoffs, let's say, that played a team in Division One would get six points for playing up. So that was a way to make it equitable. And, of course, there probably needs to be tweaks to that moving forward as well, but – um, we're always working and talking with our with our coaches and and our administrators, and everybody has a chance to present a proposal that'll be voted on by member school principals in January at the annual convention every year. So I think that power rating system is 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 definitely a great thing for not only football but the other sports as well that 
use power rating systems. Yeah, Coach, I, you know, along those lines, it's a great explanation. Along those lines also, I've always been a proponent, especially now because you have so many changes in school. You have more sports. When you and I first grew up, we had four major sports, you know, football, basketball, track, and, and then the, uh, and, and baseball naturally. But now all of a sudden, with the advent of all these other sports, you know, you can have bass fishing, bowling, and things of that nature, and, and all the major girls' sports. And, and um, I always thought that the AD had to be the person out in front because that AD should be on top of the rules. It should be in front of the school because that principal has so many things to do. She can't or he can't keep up with all the many little t- t- tweaks that take place during the year, the rule changes, stuff like that. I've always thought the athletic director or the head football coach, whatever, whoever you designate as your school leader, to vote for the school because every school gets only one vote anyway. It doesn't really matter, but it should be someone because you and I have both been in the meetings where the principal would turn around and ask the, the look at the coach in the back of the room. That's that has been tweaked, but you have know, always felt like the athletic director who knows a little bit more about his sport and his people and vote for the school should be the, the really person standing out in front. Yeah, that's a great point. And you have some principals out there that, that, have uh, definitely taken that mindset as well. And a lot of that has to do with you have a lot of administrators now where um, they have to fall back on, on their athletic director's knowledge or uh, the coach in that sport. When there's a golf proposal out there, Hey, I need to ask my golf coach or my athletic director about this because I may not be familiar with this or, if it's just a general bylaw out there, not with a specific sport, um, to get educated and talk to other principals. These days, every I believe there we have on average 25 to 33 percent of our 404 member schools are new principals every year. So you have brand new principals coming in. Some of them are, are moving up from assistant principal in charge of academics or curriculum and instruction, or maybe they were dean of students. Maybe they were the campus ministry director. Maybe they moved in from out of state. They may have been a lifelong <laughs> teacher that all of a sudden ascends to uh, becoming principal at their school, and they don't have that background knowledge. And so you really need strong athletic directors. Um, you you you're seeing some coaches that have become athletic directors move into administration that become principals. But if you think about back in the day, 20, 30 years ago, coach, where you saw a lot of coaches right. retired, they moved and you don't have that anymore. Right. Exactly. It's a great, a great explanation. Coach, I want to talk to you a little bit about what would you like to see in terms of colleges that recruiting our athletes, uh, what are some of the rules you would like to see them Im- implement that might help the high school, the high school athlete? I saw just the other day something that really puzzled me that some uh, great players in high school, these five star guys are foregoing their senior year and they're entering into the spring training of, the, of their college of their choice. Uh, what's your take on that? Boy, I, the, the first time we saw this and this was light years ago, it was 2003. You remember John David Booty at, at Evangel. He played yes. his junior year, um, coached against him in the semifinals when I was on great staff at Rummel, and um, they had a great team, gosh. And uh, he played his junior year, and he was supposed to come back in 03, and he for, he, he, he went um, – He I'm trying to think of the verb now, but he decided not to uh, <laughs> return to Evangel, and he enrolled in USC, and he – skipped his senior year. He had enough credits because he, he was a really smart guy and he always was one step ahead academically. So he had all the credits and he enrolled at USC, but that was in 2002, 2003. So 20 years ago. And now you're starting to see it as you, as you mentioned, um, there's always a trickle down effect on things. Um, you're seeing the transfer portal now widespread in college, and you're starting to see that along with the with the thinking of parents at the high school level, um, a large number of of um, eligibility ruling requests in that our office takes every year. But it seems like more so this year, and it goes to that transfer portal where 
a lot of these parents think, well, they're doing it in college. Well, certainly I can do it in high school where I can just bounce from one school to the next, which is not the case. So a lot of those things trickle down with NIL. We're starting to see that um, throughout high school. We haven't really seen it that much in, if at all, in, in Louisiana, which is a, a good thing, I guess you could say. I guess I'm an old school guy. I'm starting to understand that in the transfer portal at the college level, but definitely at the high school level, that kind of thing, when you stay with – really has no place unless you stay within – the, bio, the eligibility bylaws in, in the LHSA handbook. But um, I, I think with the recruiting, though, you're seeing a change where it, colleges used to sign 20 guys and maybe a few junior college transfers. And now you're seeing where it's the majority of college, college signees are from the transfer portal. And you may have five to seven high school guys in some case, some cases, sign with with a college so i think that's a big concern of high school coaches and athletic directors and um i remember when you you'd get a guy that was a really good fcs one double a prospect and now some of those guys aren't having that opportunity because you have those fbs transfers those guys that jump in the portal and their best chance to play is go the FCS route or just the opposite. You're seeing a lot of those FCS guys go to the FBS. You got two guys starting in the secondary for LSU that are a McNeese and a Southeastern transfer. So I think the transfer portal, I think I got most of that right, but I think the transfer portal is really something that's come in and has just consumed college recruiting. I agree, Coach. What you're having now, a lot of high school kids are being overlooked, and they're and what happens to them. I've seen a lot of them, and they're not being recruited because the uh, colleges are waiting for the portal to open up to look for that that need based guy that that, that would help their program immediately. And the the other side of that, you know, is that uh, junior college kids are, are caught too. They're caught in that 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 same vice because they, there's nowhere for them to go if the transfer portal is going to be used. And and uh, Coach. Uh, but uh, another thing, last question, I did want to talk a little bit about your background, but the seven on seven, I noticed that the other day the Olympic committee is now going to make that Olympic sport. Do you see that coming to fruition to be maybe a sport in high school? I know. Flag, or, flag football. Sure. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think that's a really good thing where they have girls flag football coming in as an Olympic sport. I think the men's, the men's came in as an Olympic sport as well. No. Not okay, yet. just the girls. Mm-hmm. There's been a big push from the NFL and also the New Orleans Saints. We've had conversations with them. Um, the Saints sent out a survey to schools and um, on on uh, girls flag football to see what the viability is that uh, of that of that would be in the LHSA. There's a big push, like I said, from the NFL and the Saints. A lot of money's out there. Alabama and Georgia and quite a few other states. Florida have girls flag football as a as a sport could i see that being added in the in the near future possibly so you need 80 schools to uh to sign on for a sport to be added um but there but there are avenues for those girls to compete the the saints are looking at at ways to make that possible so anything we can do to help out with giving athletes an opportunity to compete in in these new sports and girls flag football is one of them. And um, you've seen it um, come to center stage last year at the Super Bowl where they had uh, girls teams from around the country um, compete at, at the site of the Super Bowl uh, the day before, if I'm not mistaken. So th- those are great opportunities. I think that'll be a great sport for the Olympics to add, see these uh, girl athletes compete. Coach, I know I- um, my two sons, Nicholas and Ty, the, the, you're on their speed dial, and my nephew, Coach Wayne Stein at, at St. Charles. And I know they call you all the time because you have an athletic background and uh, you know what you're talking about and you can fill them in with, with some answers. And at least you, you answer their phone and, and, and talk to them. But tell, before we go here, tell everybody your, your extensive background uh, and all the years that you did coach and why you're really qualified to be in that position as anybody else could be. 
Sure. I had an opportunity to compete as a high school athlete with some great coaches at Brother Martin back in the day and um, had my first opportunity as a teacher and coach. Coach George Schaefer um, had an opening on his staff at Holy Cross in 1995 and um, they needed a, a, a coach went in. Uh, they needed had a social studies opening and went in and interviewed during two days and ended up getting the job. So that's kind of the relationship part of it, as I was mentioning before. And then um, when I graduated from from college, had a had a, a different uh, career path, so to speak. I wanted to train thoroughbred racehorses. You and I have a passion in horse racing and we talk about it quite a few times a year. But that was my my career goal to train thoroughbred racehorses. And I did that for a little while, was um, on the path. Uh, moving up just as you move up as an assistant coach and then you become a coordinator, then a head coach. And that was my goal. It was going to take a few years. And um, Coach Conlon, my high school football coach, um, outside of my 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 dad, was probably the most influential male figure in my life. And he offered me – I took a break from racing and I was going to go back to the racetrack and at the fairgrounds in – uh, in November when uh, the, the meet came back to you have the Thanksgiving day opening day and uh, coach Conlon offered me the eighth grade football job and I reluctantly took it and um, I coached a few months and caught the bug but was going to go back to work in racing as a vet assistant and luckily both vet assistants that worked for one of the premier backstretch surgery outfits both of them decided to keep their job and not move on to somewhere else so i ended up staying in education and then as i mentioned before got a teaching job at holy cross was in the new orleans area for 10 years then uh natchitoches area for two and then baton rouge for 13 and uh was in it for 25 years teaching and coaching and loved it Never saw myself getting out of it. And then uh, the uh, director of the coaches association position was open and had a few coaches out there that I've been friends with for quite a long time. Dwayne Jenkins, Dwayne Thomasy, Freddie Harrison, Frank Daggs that talked to me about the opening and kind of sold me on the position. And, um, you know, the job open, I applied, interviewed and kind of the rest is history as they say it's been almost five years now it's been uh very rewarding and a great decision to uh, get out of the classroom and coaching and go do that but like you know coach you get out of it and there are you know you you have those friends you keep in coaching those relationships you build and um you know there are so many other ways to fulfill what you're missing out by not being on the field to coach. And you know that through yes. this podcast is one of those ways. So right. coaching, you do a great job with it. You know, and I wanted people to know your background. You're just not someone that was off the street that, that, that handles it. The Louisiana football, I mean, football coach association, Eric, thank you so much for being our guest tonight and, and, and good luck to you. Uh, the um, we, we just think that the world of what you what you do and, you know, it's not a dull moment because I know that your phone uh, probably you probably have two phones, your personal phone and then the business phone. So but thank you so much uh, for being with us and your insight and everything. And and if there's something else that we can do through this podcast to promote the, the sport of football or any sport for that matter, because you know, I'm a big baseball fan. We're a series going on as, as we speak. And um, uh, so we'll talk about that later on the show. But please don't hesitate to to call us we can help plug whatever you want us to plug coach thank you and it's always been fun to be around you and watch you uh coach all these years whether in high school and then at Tulane um when you were the offensive coordinator there and always encouraging high school coaches to get better at what they do and Jason thanks so much for um working with coach and um, the guests you guys have had have been great. So just lucky enough to be on that roster. And thanks again, guys. Appreciate y'all. Thank, thank you, so you very much. We want to once again thank our special guest, Eric Hill, for joining us on the Let's Be Frank video podcast. And we would also like to thank LSR for sponsoring our show. 
LSR produces Southern Cane Pure Cane Sugar, which is only grown, refined, and packaged in Louisiana. Southern Cane is available in your local associated grocers and Rasta supermarkets. Samuel Licardo Jr. and R.A.P. Dufresne, your go-to River Parish lawyers. Experience, tenacity, and results. Sammy Accardo and Ari Dufresne provide comprehensive legal services in personal injury, hurricane claims, business litigation, successions, and estate planning. Our trial experience, know-how, and commitment to protect and serve our clients is unparalleled. We provide complete real estate, title, and escrow services through our affiliate, State Title LLC. The River Parishes is our home, and serving our communities is our passion. Based out of Gramercy, Louisiana, LSR produces Southern Cane Pure Cane Sugar, which is only grown, refined, and packaged in Louisiana. LSR utilizes the latest innovations in technology, as well as ensuring the growth and stability of Louisiana sugarcane farmers by integrating more than 800 growers in the industry's economic structure. Southern Cane is available in your local associated grocers and Rouse's supermarkets. Since 1972, Riverlands Insurance Services has been dedicated to securing the best insurance products and services available to protect you, your family, your assets, and your business. Our goal has been to establish a strong relationship and partnership between you, the insurance company, and our agency, creating a circle of success that prepares for disasters before they actually happen. Welcome back to the Let's Be Frank video podcast. We want to go ahead and thank our sponsor, Riverlands Insurance, for being a part of our show. Since 1972, Riverlands Insurance Services has been dedicated to securing the best insurance products and services available to protect you, your family, your assets, and your business. So we're going to go ahead and dive into the Let's Be Frank segment presented by ULCS. And Coach, today we are going to talk about should high schools cut through tryouts in high school sports? Guys, this is something I've been wanting to talk about for a long time. It's been very dear to my heart. Uh, years ago when I first started coaching, when I first became a head coach, and this was happened to be in baseball, uh, I had a, a, a cut system because I, I only had 18 uniforms and I cut a kid. And after that one moment, I still regret that to the day that I did that. And what I've learned since that time is not to, not to use the cutting process whatsoever. And you say, well, coach, how do you handle all those kids? Well, you one, you go to your principal and you ask for, for more money to buy more uniforms, and you keep those kids around. You give them a role. Say, okay, you, you're on the team, you made the football team, or you made the baseball team, but this is your role. And uh, if we're in this situation, if you're on special teams or whatever it is, this is your role. You might be a scout teamer, but I want you to know this is your role. Don't come back to me later on and say, so if it puts all the, all the emphasis on the kid, so if he wants to endure that, go to practice, be a part of the team, be a part of the success, and be a part of the program, that's all on him. But I've seen too many cases where this is, this turns off kids and so there's something that they won't do, they won't join another team. So the team grows. You get numbers that way. You get a lot of numbers. And, and who's to say I'm going to cut a kid at 13, 14 years of age? He might grow and get bigger and stronger. Years ago, I'm not going to say that the school I was coaching at a high school and my coaching staff, we had a sophomore. The kid was really clumsy. And the coach said, guys, we need to cut this kid because he's going to get somebody hurt on the team. And I said, the guys, I said, that kid's been part of the team. He's at practice every day. He's in the weight room every day. He's always where he's supposed to be. Well, don't you know that kid as a senior was six foot three, weighed 215 pounds. He started for us. He made all district as a player. Now he's a very, very successful program. And I just think, I mean, a, a financial advisor, I just think back, had I cut that kid, I don't know what his future might have done. I'm not saying that he would not have been a success, but the fact that I know he enjoyed his high school experience and he stuck with the program. Uh, I know a lady that told me a similar story. She said she went out to be a cheerleader when she was a ninth grader. 
and and she was cut as a cheerleader. You know what she said? I never went out for another thing for the rest of my rest of my high school career. So all of a sudden, that destroys your dignity, destroys your, your confidence about doing that. So I don't understand whether it's a cheerleader or, or or a football player or a baseball player. I don't understand why that process has to be in place. They say, well, because we have to go to competition. Well, competition cut your team down then, but let those the kids do something. Very first principal, Mr. Norman Buck, that I worked for way back at Lutcher High School, he would he would scour the halls, and if he saw someone in the hallway, maybe someone that was a little, little shy or someone that was an introvert, he'd go to him and say, hey, why don't you just join the flag corps? Why don't you do something? He always wanted involvement. He preached that all the time. Of all the kids in school, he wanted them involved with something. So this cut process really, really it, 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 it makes me upset sometimes when, when, this, when this happens. Because, one, think about this now. When you have a football player, for instance, that's on your football team, you gonna and he's on the sideline dressed out. You're gonna have two parents at the game. You might have four grandparents at the game, plus the friends and relatives that have been there. And it's up to him if he decides that, wait a minute, but he's not playing, but he's part of something. He's part of that experience. He's part of that structure, the discipline that a coach can give him. He's got he's he's got acquaintances and friendship that he will have forever, forever in his life, rather than being cut. Because I've seen some of these kids, you know, being cut and all of a sudden mom and dad will cry with them. That kid will cry. They're devastated. When, when that process takes place. I don't see the reason for it. I mean, there's a way around this. Well, coach, how can, I, how can I play more games? Well, get more JV games, get more ninth grade games, put them, put them there. Find a way to keep them active. And I don't care what you have to do, but find some way and give them a, a role or something that they have to do in school. And uh, because especially in high school, and I don't think, you know, when they get to the major leagues or something, they're playing for money or they get in the pro ball, they're playing for money. That's a totally different animal. Then they have to they have to produce. But when it comes to high school sports, I think we you let them out, get them involved. And I always said, I think every kid for us in football, every boy that's able, physically able, should go off for high school football and be on that football team. And 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 I because I think give them the structure and give them the discipline, the accountability that they need. And I think they'll make them better men. And I, I can speak to that coach. Uh, again, I was by no means a, a, a playmaker for, for our team, but again, I, I don't think I, I know. I'm not, I think I know I wouldn't be where I am right now. The, the person I am, the, the leader that I have to be at work every day, if it wasn't for you and the staff that you put together and being a part of that program, uh, being held accountable, 15 minutes early or you're late. Again, that's these are things that I've, I've taken with me throughout my entire life. And I can speak on behalf of everybody who's played for you. And and I can say that I I know that I am who I am right now because of you. And, um, it, it's because you didn't cut. Because I, I know I wouldn't have made the team, coach. I, I was I was by I was I was four I was four foot. I was five foot six. I weighed a buck forty playing linebacker, soaking wet. I couldn't I couldn't lift two hundred pounds of bench press. Um, but again, you you stuck with me. You allowed me to be part of the program and made me part of that process. And again, I'm I'm forever grateful for for that for not having cutting and, and everything yeah. that you guys have done. You were there. You were tough. You were tough. You were there for for everything. Because you never missed school. You never missed practice. You never missed a weight session. You were there for everything. And that's so big. And because you learned accountability and the structure. And that that's what it's all about. It's not about those trophies on the wall. And uh, so. Hopefully that's what we can give those people is the culture and all the friendship that you acquired. You know, we just had a reunion a week ago with some of my 1970 Nickel State baseball team. We didn't talk about a game. No, we talked about relationships, the experiences that we had got off the field. And that, that, that that's something you don't put in the can of Campbell, Campbell soup. <laughs> Absolutely. In our next topic, in our Blitz the Ball Coach segment, we are going to talk about sign stealing. Because, you know, it's funny that all the horrible, they, they, they can't wait to get after horrible. And, uh, you know, for something, uh, I think that, you know, science stealing has been going on for years. And whether it's science stealing, whatever you want to classify it as, it's not really, it's, if you're, if you're out there and, uh, and, and you're giving signals out and I can pick up your signals, whose fault is that? Is that my fault that you don't use the signal? You know, for baseball, for instance, if I find that I'm giving the signals and the other coach has my signals and they know what pitch is coming, let your catcher call the game. That way they can't steal it from the catcher. Let him call the game. Uh, you know, I mean, that's happened in baseball for years. It's been going on. Sometimes I play with a couple guys that sat next to me on the, on the bench sometime during off innings, and they can tell me before I went to the plate how what pitch was coming just by watching the guy's hand, to watch what, the way he dropped the glove and things like, like that. Now, 
if a, if a, if a coach is going in and they're videoing something or if they're doing something, you know, that they're not supposed to be going in an office or something, someone else where they don't belong, they're trespassing, that's a totally different animal. But as far as if you see guys on, on the sideline with these big cards and things of that nature, or they'll have three people give them signals on the side. They have three people giving them signals, and, and now one is dead. and I mean, one is live, the other two are dead, which means the quarterbacks know which series, which one is live, which one is dead. Well, it, it's that's on you. If, if, a, if a coach can pick that up, it's a credit to them. Don't use them. You don't have to do that. You still can use the old point of express system. There are a lot of ways, or you can just use the cards. There are a lot of ways that you can negate that. So that is so overrated. That's people that, that on a witch hunt to try to get Jim Harbaugh or other people for something that could easily be corrected. Now, again, if somebody's sneaking in your office and they're stealing tape, or that's that's a totally different thing. But as far as as, 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 as going overboard with this, I think it's something that they just have to hardball and, and the University of Michigan because they're winning. If, if, would they do this if they were 11? They could care less if they were 11. No, but since they're, they're, regular, they're number two in the country, everybody's going to have their eyes on hardball, which they have since he's gotten there. Yeah, Coach, and uh, it's one big thing is during a live game, if a team were to have your signals, and can you explain – why that makes it so difficult as a coach. So let's say you're not aware that the other team knows your signals in a regular game. If another team, if another team is able to pick up your signals, figure it out, why is that so impactful to a coach during the course of a game? Well, because if, if I can tell what, what your personnel group is going to be, first of all, there are coaches in the press box that do this in the high school level. As soon as you swap out, I can tell when you're going to 11 personnel, when you go to 21 personnel. I can tell when you're going to the robust group or whatever you want to call them. I can tell that. you got a guy in the press box. That's all he watches. So I can, so, And I swap with that. I have to match up with you putting on the field. So if you're going to four wide outs, well, I'm going to go to my dying package. So, I mean, that's that's part of that. That's not, that's not sign stealing. That's just watching personnel go in the field. So uh, how I think it's really overrated because if I do have your signals, I have to hurry up and communicate that downstairs and get that to my players just like that. And that's hard to do, especially with a 40-second clock. You know, it's a, and, and most time the ball will snap within those 40 seconds. So th- the bottom line is that can you take advantage of Probably every now and then you might it might be, but for most time, most part, it's very very overrated. And when it comes to that, and you hear a lot of discussion about that, and I, I don't think that I don't think that gives that much credibility. And there's a way that you can stop it. So quit doing it. if you if you do figure it out and people know your plays. And you hear that all the time. A well schooled team on defense, Jason. When you played linebacker, if you're well schooled and you see the formation on the other side, you. Well, here comes the lead play. Here comes the power play. Here comes the stretch play. Here's pass. They're passing out because the linemen don't have their hands on the ground. Uh, so that maybe they're passing or something like that. So there are a lot of little things that you pick up as a player on the field. That is that cheating? No, it's not. That's just scout. I mean, you watch film for those reasons. I know exactly that quarterbacks when, when he's going to what play he's going to run. I can tell the formation uh, or, or maybe the stance of a player. There's so many little things that. That, the, that that a good defensive player can pick up on their own without stealing the sign. And, uh, Coach, one thing that you and your program has always been great at is scouting opponents. And I think if other teams had any idea how well scouted they were when they played you, they would have done some more self-scouting and, and maybe tried to break some tendencies because every time they went out with a certain specific group in a certain situation, we, we had a game plan for it. We knew what we – basically, and there was no sign stealing. It was scouting, and uh, that was a credit to the work that you and your staff did. But we knew where they were going. Are they rolling out right? Are they rolling out left? Are they hitting the X or the Y receiver? What's the route combination? What run play are they running in third and three if the ball is on the left hash? You knew that. And um, yeah, as you mentioned, not not sign stealing, just scouting. And uh, But your your staff was always exceptional at that. Well, you, know, you can't. You can't. In, in one week's time, you're going to have three practices for a game plan. So, for instance, the big games this week, you practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday is that much of a practice. You have a little walkthrough and just reminders, whatever. But you, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, practice so in high school. In college, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And uh, Friday is normally a travel day. But, you know, your preparation is the most important thing. You can't change your game plan. You can't change your offense and your defense in three, in three practices. So you might tweak it. And, of course, you're going to add a play. You're going to add a scheme. You're going to add a route. Uh, defense, you might you – might, 
you, you might add a stunt or a blitz or something like that or coverage, but you can't change the whole your whole structure of what you've worked on all year long. So that's what you base that on. And that all goes back to watching film, pre- preparing for that, and we call it digging. Because all of a sudden you never know when you pick up something like 12 o'clock. And I watched that tape four times already, but all of a sudden the fifth time I watched it, I just picked up something I didn't see before. And you, you pass that gene on to me, Coach. I love. I'm I'm a film junkie. I love I love watching tape, and I love seeing what we can dissect. It's uh, w- when I was coaching, it was I loved it. Uh, it was it was fascinating to me. But let's go ahead and move on to our lock of the week. Who do you like this week, uh, Coach? I I think what I'm going to do. I, I think I'm going to take Air Force, e- even though I don't. I hate to pick against the service academy like Army. But I saw Army play LSU, and they weren't very impressive on either side of the ball. And Air Force is actually ranked right now, so this is the highest ranking they've had in years. And, and uh, you know, it's really good to see the service academies actually uh, have good seasons because we all pull for them because of the commitment that they already have. And I think they're very, very special guys, and they're not going to quit no matter what because of their training. Those, they, those guys get up at 5 o'clock every morning, and, and, and they, they have a regiment that they all have to adhere to plus practice football. So, But even so, I'm going to go with the Air Force because I think they're really, really good football team. Yeah, I, and right now, if the season were to end today, they would have that automatic uh, berth in the uh, major bowl games. I'm going to go with Louisville. They are a nine-and-a-half-point favorite over Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech's had a bit of a rocky road. Louisville's played some pretty good ball clubs, and they've been very consistent. Nine and a half points. It it seems like it's too good to be true. Maybe that's Vegas playing a trick on me. But I just I like what they've done so far uh, under head coach Brom. I, I think he's a a really good coach. He did a fantastic job at Purdue and getting to, you as you know, coach. If getting to go back and coach where you uh, where you graduated from has a little bit of a different feeling to it. So oh, they, they're really good on defense too. I mean, yeah. they're really they're coming off a shutout. They're really good on defense and. They're shocking people right now. They only have one loss, so you never know what's going to happen that down this, especially with all these championship games coming up. Right. Uh, there's still some football to be played here, you know, in, in college because they play a 12 game schedule. So um, look at LSU, what's coming up for them. I mean, after Alabama, you know, they got the meat of their schedule right here in front of them. Thank you, coach. And that'll do it for our show tonight. So we'll go ahead and give you guys our social medias to follow. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, X, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, Facebook is the Let's Be Frank video podcast. Uh, X, Instagram, and TikTok is the LBF podcast. And that'll do it for tonight. So next week we are going to have special guest Matt Moscona uh, out of Baton Rouge joining us. It, it should be a great show coming off of the Alabama game. Uh, Coach, any final thoughts before we get out of here? Okay, guys, I just let's pray for let's pray for our country, pray for our world, and let's pray for the war overseas and let's hope that things settle down and and, uh and and just 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 remember to uh let's let's support this great game of football so that'll do it for us so for justin thomas for head coach frank monica i am jason Dewey, and remember let's lay ball to him we'll lay with the good times roll